the first and second phases of christ's life from preparation for a christian life by soren kierkegaard published in eighteen fifty translated by lee m hollander in nineteen twenty three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. The First Phase of His Life And now let us speak about him in a homely fashion, just as his contemporaries spoke about him, and as one speaks about some contemporary. Let him be a man of the same kind as we are, whom one meets on the street in passing, of whom one knows where he lives, and in what story what his business is who his parents are his family how he looks and how he dresses with whom he associates and there is nothing extraordinary about him he looks as men generally look in short let us speak of him as one speaks of some contemporary about whom one does not make a great ado for in living life together with these thousands upon thousands of real people there is no room for a fine distinction like this possibly this man will be remembered in centuries to come and at the same time he is really only a clerk in some shop who is no whit better than his fellows therefore let us speak about him as contemporaries speak about some contemporary i know very well what i am doing and i want you to believe that the canting and indolent world historic habit we have of always reverently speaking about christ since one has learned all about it from history and has heard so much about his having been something very extraordinary indeed or something of that kind that reverent habit i assure you is not worth a row of pins but is rather sheer thoughtlessness hypocrisy and as such blasphemy for it is blasphemy to reverence thoughtlessly him whom one is either to believe in or to be offended in it is the lowly jesus christ a humble man born of a maiden of low degree whose father is a carpenter to be sure his appearance is made under conditions which are bound to attract attention to him the small nation among whom he appears god's chosen people as they call themselves live in anticipation of a messiah who is to bring a golden period to land and people you must grant that the form in which he appears is as different as possible from what most people would have expected on the other hand his appearance corresponds more to the ancient prophecies with which the people are thought to have been familiar thus he presents himself a predecessor has called attention to him and he himself fastens attention very decidedly on himself by signs and wonders which are noised abroad in all the land and he is the hero of the hour surrounded by unnumbered multitudes of people wherever he fares the sensation aroused by him is enormous every one's eyes are fastened on him every one who can go about ay even those who can only crawl must see the wonder and every one must have some opinion about him so that the purveyors of ready-made opinions are put to it because the demand is so furious and the contradiction so confusing and yet he the worker of miracles ever remains the humble man who literally hath not where to lay his head and let us not forget signs and wonders as contemporary events have a markedly greater elasticity in repelling or attracting than the tame stories generally rehashed by the priests and the still tamer stories about signs and wonders that happened eighteen hundred years ago signs and wonders as contemporary events are something plaguy and importunate 
something which in a highly embarrassing manner almost compels one to have an opinion something which if one does not happen to be disposed to believe may exasperate one excessively by thus forcing one to be contemporaneous with it indeed it renders existence too complicated and the more so the more thoughtful developed and cultured one is it is a peculiarly ticklish matter this having to assume that a man who is contemporaneous with one really performs signs and wonders but when he is at some distance from one when the consequences of his life stimulate the imagination a bit then it is not so hard to imagine in a fashion that one believes it as i said then the people are carried away with him they follow him jubilantly and see signs and wonders both those which he performs and those which he does not perform and they are glad in their hope that the golden age will begin once he is king but the crowd rarely have a clear reason for their opinions they think one thing today and another tomorrow therefore the wise and critical will not at once participate let us see now what the wise and critical must think so soon as the first impression of astonishment and surprise has subsided the shrewd and critical man would probably say even assuming that this person is what he claims to be that is something extraordinary for as to his affirming himself to be god i can of course not consider that as anything but an exaggeration for which i willingly make allowances and pardon him if i really consider him to be something extraordinary for i am not a pedant assuming then which i hesitate to do for it is a matter on which i shall at any rate suspend my judgment assuming then that he is really performing miracles is it not an inexplicable mystery that this person can be so foolish so weak-minded so altogether devoid of worldly wisdom so feeble or so good-naturedly vain or whatever else you please to call it that he behaves in this fashion and almost forces his benefactions on men instead of proudly and commandingly keeping people away from himself at a distance marked by their profoundest submission whenever he does allow himself to be seen at rare occasions instead of doing so think of his being accessible to everyone or rather himself going to everyone of having intercourse with everybody almost as if being the extraordinary person consisted in his being everybody's servant as if the extraordinary person he claims to be were marked by his being concerned only lest men should fail to be benefited by him in short as if being an extraordinary person consisted in being the most solicitous of all persons the whole business is inexplicable to me what he wants what his purpose is what end he has in mind what he expects to accomplish in a word what the meaning of it all is he who by so many a wise saying reveals so profound an insight into the human heart he must certainly know what i using but half of my wits can predict for him namely that in such fashion one gets nowhere in the world unless indeed despising prudence one consistently aims to make a fool of oneself or perchance goes so far in sincerity as to prefer being put to death but any one desiring that must certainly be crazy having such profound knowledge of the human heart he certainly ought to know that the thing to do is to deceive people and then to give one's deception the appearance of being a benefaction conferred on the whole race by doing so one reaps all advantages even the one whose enjoyment is the sweetest of all which is to be called by one's contemporaries a benefactor of the human race for once in your grave you may snap your fingers at what posterity may have to say about you 
but to surrender oneself altogether as he does and not to think the least of oneself in fact almost to beg people to accept these benefactions no i would not dream of joining his company and of course neither does he invite me for indeed he invites only them that labor and are heavy laden or he would reason as follows his life is simply a fantastic dream in fact that is the mildest expression one can use about it for when judging him in this fashion one is good-natured enough to forget altogether the evidence of sheer madness in his claim to be god this is wildly fantastical one may possibly live a few years of one's youth in such fashion but he is now past thirty years and he is literally nothing still further in a very short time he will necessarily lose all the respect and reputation he has gained among the people the only thing you may say he has gained for himself one who wishes to keep in the good graces of the people the riskiest chance imaginable i will admit he must act differently not many months will pass before the crowd will grow tired of one who is altogether at their service he will be regarded as a ruined person a kind of outcast who ought to be glad to end his days in a corner the world forgetting by the world forgot provided he does not by continuing his previous behavior prefer to maintain his present attitude and be fantastic enough to wish to be put to death which is the unavoidable consequence of persevering in that course what has he done for his future nothing has he any assured position no what expectations has he none even this trifling matter what will he do to pass the time when he grows older the long winter nights what will he do to make them pass why he cannot even play cards he is now enjoying a bit of popular favor in truth of all movable property the most movable which in a trice may turn into an enormous popular hatred of him join his company no thank you i am still thank god in my right mind or he may reason as follows that there is something extraordinary about this person even if one reserves the right both one's own and that of common sense to refrain from venturing any opinion as to his claim of being god about that there is really little doubt rather one might be indignant at providences having entrusted such a person with these powers a person who does the very opposite of what he himself bids us do that we shall not cast our pearls before the swine for which reason he will as he himself predicts come to grief by their turning about and trampling him under their feet one may always expect this of swine but on the other hand one would not expect that he who had himself called attention to this likelihood himself would do precisely what he knows one should not do if only there were some means of cleverly stealing his wisdom for i shall gladly leave him in indisputed possession of that very peculiar thought of his that he is god if one could but rob his wisdom without at the same time becoming his disciple if one could only steal up to him at night and lure it from him for i am more than equal to editing and publishing it and better than he if you please i undertake to astonish the whole world by getting something altogether different out of it for i clearly see there is something wondrously profound in what he says and the misfortune is only that he is the man he is but perhaps who knows perhaps it is feasible anyway to fool him out of it perhaps in that respect too he is good-natured and simple enough to communicate it quite freely to me it is not impossible for it seems to me that the wisdom he unquestionably possesses evidently has been entrusted to a fool 
seeing there is so much contradiction in his life but as to joining his company and becoming his disciple no indeed that would be the same as becoming a fool oneself or he might reason as follows if this person does indeed mean to further what is good and true i do not venture to decide this he is helpful at least in this respect to youths and inexperienced people for they will be benefited in this serious life of ours by learning the sooner the better and very thoroughly he opens the eyes even of the blindest to this that all this pretense of wishing to live only for goodness and truth contains a considerable admixture of the ridiculous he proves how right the poets of our times are when they let truth and goodness be represented by some half-witted fellow one who is so stupid that you can knock down a wall with him the idea of exerting oneself as this man does of renouncing everything but pains and trouble to be at beck and call all day long more eager than the busiest family physician and pray why because he makes a living by it no not in the least it has never occurred to him as far as i can see to want something in return does he earn any money by it no not a red cent he has not a red cent to his name and if he did he would forthwith give it away does he then aspire to a position of honor and dignity in the state on the contrary he loathes all worldly honor and he who as i said condemns all worldly honor and practices the art of living on nothing he who if any one seems best fitted to pass his life in a most comfortable dulce far niente which is not such a bad thing he lives under a greater strain than any government official who is rewarded by honor and dignity lives under a greater strain than any business man who earns money like sand why does he exert himself thus or why this question about a matter not open to question why should any one exert himself thus in order to attain to the happiness of being ridiculed mocked and so forth to be sure a peculiar kind of pleasure that one should push one's way through a crowd to reach the spot where money honor and glory are distributed why that is perfectly understandable but to push forward to be whipped how exalted how christian how stupid or he will reason as follows one hears so many rash opinions about this person from people who understand nothing and worship him and so many severe condemnations of him by those who perhaps misunderstand him after all as for me i am not going to allow myself to be accused of venturing a hasty opinion i shall keep entirely cool and calm in fact which counts for still more i am conscious of being as reasonable and moderate with him as is possible grant now which to be sure i do only to a certain extent grant even that one's reason is impressed by this person what then is my opinion about him my opinion is that for the present i can form no opinion about him i do not mean about his claim of being god for about that i can never in all eternity have an opinion no i mean about him as a man only by the consequences of his life shall we be able to decide whether he was an extraordinary person or whether deceived by his imagination he applied too high a standard not only to himself but also to humanity in general more i cannot do for him try as i may if he were my only friend my only child i could not judge him more leniently nor differently either it follows from this to be sure that in all probability and for good reasons i shall not ever be able to have any opinion about him 
for in order to be able to form an opinion i must first see the consequences of his life including his very last moments that is he must be dead then and perhaps not even then may i form an opinion of him and even granting this it is not really an opinion about him for he is then no more no more is needed to say why it is impossible for me to join him while he is living the authority he is said to show in his teaching can have no decisive influence in my case for it is surely easy to see that his thought moves in a circle he quotes as authority that which he is to prove which in its turn can be proved only by the consequences of his life provided of course it is not connected with that fixed idea of his about being god because if it is therefore he has this authority because he is god the answer must be yes if so much however i may admit that if i could imagine myself living in some later age and if the consequences of his life as shown in history had made it plain that he was the extraordinary person he in a former age claimed to be then it might very well be in fact i might come very near becoming his disciple an ecclesiastic would reason as follows for an impostor and demagogue he has to say the truth a remarkable air of honesty about him for which reason he cannot be so absolutely dangerous either even though the situation looks dangerous enough while the squall is at its height and even though the situation looks dangerous enough with his enormous popularity until the squall has passed over and the people yes precisely the people overthrow him again the honest thing about him is his claim to be the messiah when he resembles him so little as he does that is honest just as if someone in preparing bogus paper money made the bills so poorly that everyone who knows the least about it cannot fail to detect the fraud true enough we all look forward to a messiah but surely no one with any sense expects god himself to come and every religious person shudders at the blasphemous attitude of this person we look forward to a messiah we are all agreed on that but the governance of the world does not go forward tumultuously by leaps and bounds the development of the world as is indicated by the very fact that it is a development proceeds by evolution not by revolution the true messiah will therefore look quite different and will arrive as the most glorious flower and the highest development of that which already exists thus will the true messiah come and he will proceed in an entirely different fashion he will recognize the existing order as the basis of things he will summon all the clergy to council and present to them the results accomplished by him as well as his credentials and then if he obtain the majority of the votes when the ballot is cast he will be received and saluted as the extraordinary person as the one he is the messiah however there is a duplicity in this man's behavior he assumes too much the role of judge it seems as if he wished to be at one and the same time both the judge who passes sentence on the existing order of things and the messiah if he does not wish to play the role of the judge then why his absolute isolation his keeping at a distance from all which has to do with the existing order of things and if he does not wish to be the judge then why his fantastic flight from reality to join the ignorant crowd then why with the haughtiness of a revolutionary does he despise all the intelligence and efficiency to be found in the existing order of things and why does he begin afresh altogether 
and absolutely from the bottom up by the help of fishermen and artisans may not the fact that he is an illegitimate child fitly characterize his entire relation to the existing order of things on the other hand if he wishes to be only the messiah why then his warning about putting a piece of new cloth onto an old garment for these words are precisely the watchwords of every revolution since they are expressive of a person's discontent with the existing order and of his wish to destroy it that is these words reveal his desire to remove existing conditions rather than to build on them and better them if one is a reformer or to develop them to their highest possibility if one is indeed the messiah this is duplicity in fact it is not feasible to be both judge and messiah such duplicity will surely result in his downfall the climax in the life of a judge is his death by violence and so the poet pictures it correctly but the climax in the life of the messiah cannot possibly be his death or else by that very fact he would not be the messiah that is he whom the existing order expects in order to deify him this duplicity has not as yet been recognized by the people who see in him their messiah but the existing order of things cannot by any manner of means recognize him as such the people the idle and loafing crowd can do so only because they represent nothing less than the existing order of things but as soon as the duplicity becomes evident to them his doom is sealed why in this respect his predecessor has a far more definitely marked personality for he was but one thing the judge but what confusion and thoughtlessness to wish to be both and what still worse confusion to acknowledge his predecessor as the judge that is in other words precisely to make the existing order of things receptive and ripe for the messiah who is to come after the judge and yet not wish to associate himself with the existing order of things and the philosopher would reason as follows such dreadful or rather insane vanity that a single individual claims to be god is a thing hitherto unheard of never before have we been witness to such an excess of pure subjectivity and sheer negation he has no doctrines no system of philosophy he knows really nothing he simply keeps on repeating and making variations on some unconnected aphoristic sentences some few maxims and a couple of parables by which he dazzles the crowd for whom he also performs signs and wonders so that they instead of learning something or being improved come to believe in one who in a most brazen way constantly forces his subjective views on us there is nothing objective or positive whatever in him and in what he says indeed from a philosophical point of view he does not need to fear destruction for he has perished already since it is inherent in the nature of subjectivity to perish one may in all fairness admit that his subjectivity is remarkable and that be it as it may with the other miracles he constantly repeats his miracle with the five small loaves namely by means of a few lyric utterances and some aphorisms he rouses the whole country but even if one were inclined to overlook his insane notion of affirming himself to be god it is an incomprehensible mistake which to be sure demonstrates a lack of philosophic training to believe that god could reveal himself in the form of an individual the race the universal the total is god but the race surely is not an individual generally speaking that is the impudent assumption of subjectivity which claims that the individual is something extraordinary 
but sheer insanity is shown in the claim of an individual to be god because if the insane thing were possible namely that an individual might be god why then this individual would have to be worshipped and a more beastly philosophic stupidity is not conceivable the astute statesman would reason as follows that at present this person wields great power is undeniable entirely disregarding of course this notion of his that he is god foibles like these being idiosyncrasies do not count against a man and concern no one least of all a statesman a statesman is concerned only with what power a man wields and that he does wield great power cannot as i have remarked be denied but what he intends to do what his aim is i cannot make out at all if this be calculation it must be of an entirely new and peculiar order not so altogether unlike what is otherwise called madness he possesses points of considerable strength but he seems to defeat rather than to use it he expends it without himself getting any returns i consider him a phenomenon with which as ought to be one's rule with all phenomena a wise man should not have anything to do since it is impossible to calculate him or the catastrophe threatening his life it is possible that he will be made king it is possible i say but it is not impossible or rather it is just as possible that he may end on the gallows he lacks earnestness in all his endeavours with all his enormous stretch of wings he only hovers and gets nowhere he does not seem to have any definite plan of procedure but just hovers is it for his nationality he is fighting or does he aim at a communistic revolution does he wish to establish a republic or a kingdom with which party does he affiliate himself to combat which party or does he wish to fight all parties i have anything to do with him no that would be the very last thing to enter my mind in fact i take all possible precaution to avoid him i keep quiet undertake nothing act as if i did not exist for one cannot even calculate how he might interfere with one's undertakings be they ever so unimportant or at any rate how one might become involved in the vortex of his activities dangerous in a certain sense enormously dangerous is this man but i calculate that i may ensnare him precisely by doing nothing for overthrown he must be and this is done most safely by letting him do it himself by letting him stumble over himself i have at least at this moment not sufficient power to bring about his fall in fact i know no one who has to undertake the least thing against him now means to be crushed oneself no my plan is constantly to exert only negative resistance to him that is to do nothing and he will probably involve himself in the enormous consequences he draws after him till in the end he will tread on his own train as it were and thus fall and the steady citizen would reason as follows which would then become the opinion of his family now let us be human everything is good when done in moderation too little and too much spoil everything and as a french saying has it which i once heard a travelling salesman use every power which exceeds itself comes to a fall and as to this person his fall is certainly sure enough i have earnestly spoken to my son and warned and admonished him not to drift into evil ways and join that person and why because all people are running after him that is to say what sort of people idlers and loafers street-walkers and tramps who run after everything 
but mighty few of the men who have house and property and nobody who is wise and respected none after whom i set my clock neither councillor johnson nor senator anderson nor the wealthy broker nelson oh no they know what's what and as to the ministry who ought to know most about such matters ah they will have none of him what was it pastor green said in the club the other evening that man will yet come to a terrible end he said and green he can do more than preach you oughtn't to hear him sundays in church so much as mondays in the club i just wished i had half his knowledge of affairs he said quite correctly and as if spoken out of his own heart only idlers and loafers are running after that man and why do they run after him because he performs some miracles but who is sure they are miracles or that he can confer the same power on his disciples and in any case a miracle is something mighty uncertain whereas the certain is the certain every serious father who has grown-up children must be truly alarmed lest his sons be seduced and join that man together with the desperate characters who follow him desperate characters who have nothing to lose and even these how does he help them why one must be mad to wish to be helped in this fashion even the poorest beggar is brought to a worse estate than his former one is brought to a pass he could have escaped by remaining what he was that is a beggar and no more and the mocker not the one hated on account of his malice but the one who is admired for his wit and liked for his good nature he would reason as follows it is after all a rich idea which is going to prove useful to all of us that an individual who is in no wise different from us claims to be god if that is not being a benefactor of the race then i don't know what charity and beneficence are if we assume that the characteristic of being god well who in all the world would have hit on that idea how true that such an idea could not have entered into the heart of man but if we assume that it consists in looking in no wise different from the rest of us and in nothing else why then we are all gods q e d three cheers for him the inventor of a discovery so extraordinarily important for mankind tomorrow i the undersigned shall proclaim that i am god and the discoverer at least will not be able to contradict me without contradicting himself at night all cats are gray and if to be god consists in looking like the rest of us absolutely and altogether like the rest of mankind why then it is night and we all are or what is it i wanted to say we are all god every one of us and no one has a right to say he isn't as well off as his neighbor this is the most ridiculous situation imaginable the contradiction here being the greatest imaginable and the contradiction always making for a comical effect but this is in no wise my discovery but solely that of the discoverer this idea that a man of exactly the same appearance as the rest of us only not half so well dressed as the average man that is a poorly dressed person who rather than being god seems to invite the attention of the society for the relief of the poor that he is god i am only sorry for the director of the charitable society that he will not get a raise from his general advancement of the human race but that he will rather lose his job on account of this etc ah my friend i know well what i am doing i know my responsibility and my soul is altogether assured of the correctness of my procedure now then imagine yourself a contemporary of him who invites imagine yourself to be a sufferer but consider well to what you expose yourself in becoming his disciple and following him 
you expose yourself to losing practically everything in the eyes of all wise and sensible and respected men he who invites demands of you that you surrender all give up everything but the common sense of your own times and of your contemporaries will not give you up but will judge that to join him is madness and mockery will descend cruelly upon you for while it will almost spare him out of compassion you will be thought madder than a march hare for becoming his disciple people will say that he is a wrong-headed enthusiast that can't be helped well and good but to become in all seriousness his disciple that is the greatest piece of madness imaginable there surely is but one possibility of being madder than a madman which is the higher madness of joining a madman in all seriousness and regarding him as a sage do not say that the whole presentation above is exaggerated ah you know but possibly have not fully realized it that among all the respectable men among all the enlightened and sensible men there was but one though it is easily possible that one or the other of them impelled by curiosity entered into conversation with him that there was but one among them who sought him in all seriousness and he came to him in the night and as you know in the night one walks on forbidden paths one chooses the night to go to places of which one does not like to be known as a frequenter consider the opinion of the inviter implied in this it was a disgrace to visit him something no man of honor could afford to do as little as to pay a nightly visit to but no i do not care to say in so many words what would follow this as little as come hither to me now all ye that labor and are heavy laden and i will give you rest the second phase of his life his end was what all the wise and the sensible the statesmen and the citizens and the mockers etc predicted it would be and as was later spoken to him in a moment when it would seem the most hardened ought to have been moved to sympathy and the very stones to tears he saved others let him save himself and as it has been repeated thousands upon thousands of times by thousands upon thousands what was it he spoke of before saying his hour has not yet come is it now come perchance it has been repeated alas the while the single individual the believer shudders whenever considering while yet unable to refrain from gazing into the depth of what to men is a meaningless absurdity shudders when considering that god in human guise that his divine teaching that these signs and wonders which might have made a very sodom and gomorrah reform its ways in reality produced the exact opposite and caused the teacher to be shunned hated and despised who he is one can recognize more easily now when the powerful ones and the respected ones and all the precautionary measures of those upholding the existing order have corrected any wrong conception one might have entertained about him at first now when the people have lost their patience to wait for a messiah seeing that his life instead of rising in dignity lapsed into ever greater degradation who pray does not recognize that a man is judged according to the society in which he moves and now think of his society indeed his society one might well designate as equivalent to being expelled from human society for his society are the lowest class of the people with sinners and publicans among them people whom everybody with the slightest self-respect shuns for the sake of his good name and reputation 
and a good name and reputation surely are about the least one can wish to preserve in his company there are furthermore lepers whom every one flees madmen who can only inspire terror invalids and wretches squalor and misery who then is this person that though followed by such a company still is the object of the persecution of the mighty ones he is one despised as a seducer of men an impostor a blasphemer and if any one enjoying a good reputation refrains from expressing contempt for him it is really only a kind of compassion for to fear him is to be sure something different such then is his appearance for take care not to be influenced by anything that you may have learned after the event as how his exalted spirit with an almost divine majesty never was so markedly manifest as just them ah my friend if you were the contemporary of one who is not only himself excluded from the synagogue but as you will remember whose very help meant being excluded from the synagogue i say if you were the contemporary of an outcast who in every respect answers to that term for everything has two sides then you will scarcely be the man to explain all this in terms directly contrary to appearances or which is the same thing you will not be the single individual which as you well know no one wants to be and to be which is regarded as a ridiculous oddity perhaps even as a crime and now for they are his society chiefly as to his apostles what absurdity though not what new absurdity for it is quite in keeping with the rest his apostles are some fishermen ignorant people who but the other day followed their trade and to-morrow to pile one absurdity on the other they are to go out into the wide world and transform its aspect and it is he who claims to be god and these are his duly appointed apostles now is he to make his apostles respected or are perhaps the apostles to make him respected is he the inviter is he an absurd dreamer indeed his procession would make it seem so no poet could have hit on a better idea a teacher a sage or whatever you please to call him a kind of stranded genius who affirms himself to be god surrounded by a jubilant mob himself accompanied by some publicans criminals and lepers nearest to him a chosen few his apostles and these judges so excellently competent as to what truth is these fishermen tailors and shoemakers they do not only admire him their teacher and master whose every word is wisdom and truth they do not only see what no one else can see his exaltedness and holiness nay but they see god in him and worship him certainly no poet could invent a better situation and it is doubtful if the poet would not forget the additional item that this same person is feared by the mighty ones and that they are scheming to destroy him his death alone can reassure and satisfy them they have set an ignominious punishment on joining his company on merely accepting aid from him and yet they do not feel secure and cannot feel altogether reassured that the whole thing is mere wrong-headed enthusiasm and absurdity thus the mighty ones the populace who had idolized him the populace have pretty nearly given him up only in moments does their old conception of him blaze forth again in all his existence there is not a shred the most envious of the envious might envy him to have nor do the mighty ones envy his life they demand his death for safety's sake so that they may have peace again when all has returned to the accustomed ways peace having been made still more secure by the warning example of his death these are the two phases of his life 
it began with the people idolizing him whereas all who were identified with the existing order of things all who had power and influence vengefully but in a cowardly and hidden manner laid their snares for him in which he was caught then yes but he perceived it well finally the people discovered that they had been deceived in him that the fulfillment he would bring them answered least of all to their expectations of wonders and mountains of gold so the people deserted him and the mighty ones drew the snares about him in which he was caught then yes but he perceived it well the mighty ones drew the snare together about him and thereupon the people who then saw themselves completely deceived turned against him in hatred and rage and to include that too compassion would say or among the compassionate ones for compassion is sociable and likes to assemble together and you will find spitefulness and envy keeping company with whining soft-headedness since as a heathen philosopher observed long ago no one is so ready to sympathize as an envious person among the compassionate ones the verdict would be it is really too bad that this good-hearted fellow is to come to such an end for he was really a good sort of fellow granting it was an exaggeration to claim to be god he really was good to the poor and the needy even in an odd manner by becoming one of them and going about in the company of beggars but there is something touching in it all and one can't help but feel sorry for the poor fellow who is to suffer such a miserable death for you may say what you will and condemn him as strongly as you will i cannot help feeling pity for him i am not so hard-hearted as not to feel compassion we have arrived at the last phase not of sacred history as handed down by the apostles and disciples who believed in christ but of profane history its counterpart come hither now all ye that labor and are heavy laden that is if you feel the need even if you are of all sufferers the most miserable if you feel the need of being helped in this fashion that is to fall into still greater suffering then come hither he will help you end of the first and second phases of christ's life from preparation for a christian life by soren kierkegaard published in 1850 translated by lee m hollander in 1923